Today we are going to take a look at biases, more specifically how biases influence and subsequently distort scientific experiments, making their results less reliable or even outright false. Now, biases are everywhere, even in the statement. You might know biases in the form of stereotypes, so one widely known and discussed bias would be gender bias. This bias contains the preconceptions you have regarding males and females, as in women are bad drivers even though factually they drive safer, or men under emotional stress should just be real men and suck it up. Accordingly, the Cambridge Dictionary defines biases as the action of supporting or opposing a particular person or thing in an unfair way because of allowing personal opinions to influence your judgment. However, this commonly held perspective on biases is ironically biased. Specifically, it is biased from the perspective of sociology, where scientists mostly look at social interactions and how people tend to judge the behavior of others wrongly based on presumptions about the race, gender, age, or any other demographic feature. However, we are researchers, so we are interested in how bias affect our experiments and research in general. Therefore, we need a broader definition of what a bias is, not only focusing on flaws in your behavior towards others, but towards anything that affects our research and its results. Taking the definition from a paper by Penucci and Wilkins, Bias is defined as any tendency which prevents unprejudiced consideration of a question. In research, bias occurs when systematic error is introduced into sampling or testing by selecting or encouraging one outcome or answer over others. There are two main categories of biases described in literature that affect research. Cognitive biases and statistical biases. A cognitive bias is a bias in the way we think about events, facts or humans, based on our personal experience or beliefs. These might be distorted in a way that does not reflect a rational, accurate view of things. And there are a lot of these. If you just go to Wikipedia and just scroll through the list of cognitive biases, you'll find a huge amount of vastly different cognitive biases, including some fun ones like the so-called IKEA effect. Describing how people are willing to pay more money for furniture they've assembled themselves simply because of the emotional attachment that follows. The second kind of biases are statistical biases. A statistical bias is a bias in the expected value of the result of a statistical method, leading to skewed estimations of the underlying parameters. Now, if that's not clear to you, that's really fine. For the purpose of this video, we are mostly going to focus on cognitive biases, as statistical biases are a whole thing of their own and really deserve their own dedicated video. But it is probably fair to say that, as we are interested in biases that affect the outcome of our research, and this outcome is numeric, you could argue that any bias we're looking at can also be kind of considered a statistical bias. Ultimately, it's up to the perspective you decide to take, and outside the realms of this video. Looking at how bias influences research, we can distinguish between different stages in the experimental procedure that are affected. These are namely the setup of an experiment, the conduct of the experiment, and the analysis and reporting of the experiment. Now, bias creeps in quite early during the setup of an experiment. The perspective you take on an issue already defines which variables and confounders you take into account and which ones you leave out. Consider research on emotional characteristics, like regression. Depending on whether you are a clinical psychologist or an evolutionary biologist, you will obviously be interested in completely different aspects of aggression and use differing methods. The psychologist might be more interested in the clinical issues that arise and the treatment, seeing aggression as an abnormality that needs to be treated. The evolutionary biologist might be more interested in why aggression as a trait has actually developed and how aggression in some context and to some degree might be productive for both the individual but also for the society as a whole. The background you have and the perspective you take therefore has a vast influence on your approach. Another source of bias in the setup of an experiment relates to the way in which participants are chosen. Ideally, if you want to test a hypothesis on how the average human behaves, 
you'd want to test a sample of participants that is selected from the whole population so that it kind of represents humans with all kinds of characteristics. So young and old, rich and poor, really? That's the best I could have come up with? Basically all kinds of cultural backgrounds and whatever else you can find. Research has shown, however, that the participants in most studies are weird. Now, that's not an insult. Well, depending on how you look at it, it might be. But WEIRD is an acronym that stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich and Democratic. As most research is done at Western universities and funds to recruit participants are usually quite limited, the vast majority of research is done on undergraduate students, often participating for money or university credits. This is one example of the selection bias. So, in this case, the weird properties are overrepresented, and whole parts of the world population without those properties are neglected. One example for the severe consequences selection bias can have comes from the field of medicine. Historically speaking, research in medicine was gender biased. The vast majority of participants in medical research are male. Consequently, criteria for both the diagnosis and treatments of medical conditions were often tailored to men. Therefore, most men, when reporting heart issues related to heart attacks, were correctly diagnosed and treated. Women suffering from heart attacks, however, often reported stomach-related symptoms, completely different from men's, whom the criteria for the diagnosis were based on. This often led to these women being misdiagnosed, going untreated and consequently dying, leading to a large amount of unnecessary casualties amongst women. Even if you have a flawless selection of participants and your research setup takes all possible confounders into consideration, you've still not escaped the wrath of the biases. Plenty of biases affect the performance and behavior of participants during any kind of experimental task. That is regardless of whether they perform a behavioral task, fill out a questionnaire or are being interviewed. Probably the most overarching bias, though, is the experimenter bias, sometimes also called interviewer bias. This describes the general tendency of an experimenter to act in ways that influence the participant to behave in a way that confirms the hypothesis, even though the participants wouldn't act that way in a natural setting. This can either happen due to the way experimenters phrase questions or give instructions, or even minor things like making a certain gesture that indicates content or discontent with the behavior of the participant. Experimenter bias, by the way, isn't something intentional. The researcher isn't aware of influencing the participant. It's just a natural behavior that we can't really suppress. There are multiple ways to avoid or at least minimize the interviewer bias, but the main one probably is to simply create a double-blind study. In a double-blind experiment, neither the participant nor the researcher know what experimental condition the participant has been assigned to. As a result, the researcher does not know whether the behavior of the participant confirms or contradicts his hypothesis. Another strategy is to standardize the research protocol beforehand, so that the procedure is identical for all participants, which, besides interviewer bias, also gets rid of a whole other lot of biases, as well as general variants. Biases affecting specific tasks are plentiful. Maybe the best described scenario concerns the design of questionnaires. A long list of criteria exists, making sure that the phrasing of your questions, the response selection or the administration of the questionnaire is unbiased. A classic example is the acquiescence or agreement bias according to which participants tend to agree with questions that are phrased in an agree-disagree or yes-no way. So when being offered the statement, I like tea, people tend to agree even if they find it completely disgusting. The main way to avoid these issues is simply rephrasing the questions in a more neutral manner. One possibility would be to ask, how much do you like tea? And offer a scale with multiple response options from not at all, to very much. Another option is to ask, how often do you drink tea? Which has the advantage of being a nice numeric measure, but obviously changes the content of the question. You might like it, but still not drink it too often out of habit. 
So, while there's no way to fully avoid biases, you can at least consider different options and critically assess which of them leads to the lowest confounding. By the way, one simple rule to avoid all kinds of trouble with questionnaires is keep them short. Well, not too short, obviously, but if they get too long, participants will show response fatigue and responds in a predetermined manner, not paying attention to the actual content of the questions anymore. Even after finishing up your experiment, biases aren't fully out of your way. These are mostly statistical biases, which are part of the way the analysis of the data is conducted, but it also includes biases based on what results actually get published. There are some well-known examples of drug or tobacco companies conducting multiple studies and not publishing the unfavorable ones, which is an example of publication bias. Another example is emphasizing positive results in studies testing new drugs, while simultaneously downplaying or disregarding negative side effects, the so-called reporting bias. A more current case is the emergence of confirmation bias when handling big data, often occurring in the field of artificial intelligence. The availability of large sets of data makes it possible for the researcher to look for any significant confirmation of the hypothesis by changing the parameters of a model or looking at different subsets and configurations of data until something fits, even though these are simply random and a consequence of repeated adjusting and fitting. To avoid this, indicate clearly before the study how you want to analyze the data and what you want to analyze. Also, if you're post hoc analysis, so the analysis you only specify after the experiment, does indicate a relationship, repeat the experiment and test whether your post hoc created model still holds up, making it less likely to be random. If it doesn't, well, maybe accept that it is your hypothesis that needs tweaking, not the results. So. What have you learned from this? How can you securely avoid biases in your research? Well, you probably can't. We've only scratched the surface here, but even if you go through the whole list of biases and make a checklist for your experiment, you will only really detect the phenomena that have been named and specifically investigated. But biasing goes further than this. It includes all the kinds of preconceptions, the perspectives that we've built up as individuals, cultures, but also as humans, evolutionary speaking. And it's not that this should discourage you from trying. By developing a critical mindset, you can question your ideas, expose weaknesses and flaws, try to improve what you have, find alternatives and evaluate them. But it's also about understanding that your work has limitations and understanding what these limitations are. Limitations and biases do not make your research irrelevant or worthless but they do indicate to you what the relevance and worth of your research is. Good luck, enjoy and stay critical.